Hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, Shelby Young here, fitness coordinator at uh, Hampshire Hills Athletic Club in Milford, New Hampshire. Uh, and this is the first of the nutrition discussion and education live streams. Um, so we're just going to hold up here for a couple minutes, see if we can get some more people on. Hey, we got our first person. How's it going? Uh, feel free to say hi. Let me know who's here. Uh, and, and if you have any questions that you want me to address, two people. All right, we got two people in. Um, feel free to drop them down here in the comments and uh, I'll get to them as soon as I can. I have uh, some stuff that I'm going to go over. Um, oh, wow, we're up to six, seven. Great. We got a bunch of people on here now. Um, so once again, just as a little disclaimer, um, I am not a medical doctor. Thoughts on keto. Uh, that is a deep rabbit hole to dive down. Uh, works really well for some people, does not work great for others. Um, can be tough to sustain. Uh, and and uh, diabetics and there are some other people who should be, be careful with keto. Um, there's a lot of feedback loops that go into it. It isn't as simple as just uh, eat less carbs, eat more protein, and everything will be great. Um, it can be very therapeutic, especially if you have issues with blood sugar spikes. Um, it's been used as a long time as a treatment for those with epilepsy. Uh, but, uh, I, I find that people who tend to run on lower carb usually do better as far as long-term sustainability than those that go into full keto. Um, mm -hmm. hello, how's it going everybody? Um, but like I said, we could, we could spend all day talking about that one. Um, I'll, I'll do a deeper dive on that. Um, maybe next week, uh, so we're up to 12 people here. So once again, um, if you have, uh, uh, a medical condition that is directly affected by diet, which a lot of them are, um, then make sure that you consult with your doctor or a registered dietitian that you are working specifically with. Um, we use Kim Dorval up at Nutrition in Motion quite a bit to refer out to. She's fantastic. But so if you have irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's, uh, lupus, other autoimmune conditions, diabetes, things like that, then you want to be very careful with uh, who you're listening to for nutrition advice and Unfortunately, a lot of you probably want me to tell you just exactly what to eat right now. And I don't know you. I don't know where you've been. I don't know where you're going. Um, so I'm going to give you some general guidelines, things to follow. And some of this is going to sound pretty basic. And a lot of times people are like, oh, well, I already know that. Well, good. Glad, glad you already know it. Are you doing it, though? So some of this is going to seem uh, somewhat basic. Things like maybe you need to eat more vegetables. Maybe you need to eat more protein. Maybe you need to eat less carbs. Maybe you need to eat less sugar. Maybe you need to drink less alcohol. Maybe you're uh, nutrient deficient in certain vitamins or minerals. There's a lot of different things that can go into this. But we're gonna start with just um, some real basic, basic nutritional science stuff. And let's say, feel free to pop some questions in here and I'll, I'll kind of get to them as I'm going along. Um, so let's start off with first, what the heck is a calorie? Uh, so a calorie is a unit of measure in order to bring um, one liter of water up one uh, degree Celsius. What does that mean in the scope of food? It's basically energy that's stored within food. You eat the food, you get the calories, you use that energy for different purposes, like staying alive. So, seems pretty basic. Hey, Ashley, how's it going? Uh, so, a lot of times it comes down to just a basic energy balance, you know, calories in versus calories out still matters. It's not the be all and end all, but for a lot of people, it's a good place to start that if you're just generally, if you're trying to lose weight and you're generally eating too much food, then you should probably start that. But the only way to really know that is to start journaling. I have all of my nutrition clients journal everything that they're eating, because if you're telling me, well, you know, I'm eating so little and I'm not losing weight, maybe you are. Maybe you have an issue with your thyroid or Cushing's disease or a few other issues that could cause you to have a much slower metabolism. Um, but the only way to really know, hey, Lynn, how's it going? Uh, whether or not you're, you're eating too much is to be tracking what you're eating. So it's, it's good to just get a regular spiral bound notebook and just kind of keep track of what you're eating. Um, jot it down each day because that's where we want to start first. Start with the biggest, the easiest things to deal with um, and then we can kind of fine tune from there. So if you're the way to know whether or not you're eating too much food is once again, if you generally eat the same thing every day and you're not losing weight and keep in mind, there's a difference between losing weight and losing fat. We'll get to that in a little bit. That has more to do with body composition and it's good to get your body composition checked. Um, there are the digital scales. I don't really trust a whole lot. Um, the bioimpedance units, uh, we have a, 
some larger ones here that cover more points, it covers more of your body. Because if you use either the, the scale method or just the, the hand method where you just hold the two contact points, electricity goes point A to point B. So it's literally just doing this circle in your upper body, and that's the only part of your body that's going to be measuring. So that won't give you a terribly accurate readout, but they're usually accurate. Hey, Alex, uh, they're usually accurate unto themselves. So if that's how you're using to track your body composition, then it will show changes. It can be affected a lot by your body hydration, um, but it's good to at least have an idea of where you're starting from because we want to try to feed your lean tissue. We want to be carrying around um, as much lean tissue as possible. Lean tissue is muscle, organs, bone, um, basically anything that isn't body fat. Uh, now you do need a certain amount of body fat to survive. Um, it's called essential fat. And uh, women need a little bit more than men, um, which is structured a little bit differently. Uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind as well. There is a point of being too lean or, or too thin where you can get to the point of frailty and then you're at risk for, hey, um, you know, for fractures, uh, for sarcopenia, which is a loss of muscle tissue at a dangerous rate. There is a general loss of muscle tissue as we age that's a little bit unavoidable as well as a little bit of um, interstitial fat gain that is slightly unavoidable. Um, but you can mitigate all the effects of aging by eating generally healthy and making sure that you're getting plenty of sleep, plenty of exercise. Uh, right now, obviously, things are a little bit tough. I hope you're all trying to stay safe and healthy out there, practicing your social distancing. But it can be very easy right now where a lot of you are stuck at home, uh, not able to get out and exercise as much as you want. Um, maybe you're, you know, you're at home with your kids a lot more and they want to eat a lot of less healthy foods. I would encourage you to still try to set a good example by eating as healthy as you can as often as you can. And that will encourage them to also eat healthy as well. Um, not saying you can't indulge, and, but we want to try to avoid using food as a stress coping mechanism. Um, if you get nothing else from me, uh, then I hope that you're willing to take responsibility for your diet for your nutrition, for your health. Because hopefully no one is at home pinning you down and shoving food into your mouth. If they are, then you need to call me or call the police because that, that's really not right. But otherwise, every single bit of food that goes into your mouth is your responsibility. Now, if you don't do the cooking at home, then maybe you should take a more active role in that. I'm not trying to tell you how to live your life. I'm just here to try to give some general advice on, on ways to uh, make your health a little bit better. What is a balanced, healthy combo of Brex food that work for most people? Um, so we usually want to try to get a balance of all of the different macronutrients at each meal. Um, and you can kind of tweak this along the way as you go. But the, uh, the three macronutrients, for those of you that don't know, are protein, carbohydrates, and fat. And getting a bit of a balance of each of those at every meal is a good way to kind of to start to structure your meal. So proteins are meat eggs, um, poultry, fish, things like that. Um, you can get protein from uh, certain, from all beans and from nuts, although they tend to have some of the other macronutrients. For instance, uh, a lot of nuts tend to also carry a lot of fat with it as well. And it isn't necessarily a bad thing. Hey, Sherry. Um, but you do need to figure all of that in. So the only uh, legumes that tend to carry more protein than carbohydrates are uh, chickpeas, garbanzo beans, and lentils. A lot of the others will at times have as much, if maybe up to double the carbohydrates as they do protein per bean. So something to watch out for, especially if you're going uh, vegan or vegetarian, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it is just something you need to keep more of an eye on. And same thing, carbs are not the devil. Every few years, uh, somebody comes along. Hey, mom, how's it going? Uh, everybody wants to, to point the, the finger at a certain kind of food at a particular um, food group, macronutrient, and blame it for all the woes of all mankind. And usually th that's not how it goes. If things were that simple, if there was one quick fix that you could say, oh, just don't eat this and everything will be fine. Trust me, everybody in the health and fitness industry would be telling you, don't eat that one thing. And everybody's had their turn at some point, whether it was carbs, fat, protein, sugar, uh, you know, you name, you know, grains, uh, which I was on that train for a wagon for a while too. Um, there, there's a lot of things that people try to oversimplify this stuff to. And it, while it's not 
super ridiculous rocket science, it, it can be a little bit complicated. So uh, don't be so quick to jump on like the first thing that, that just sounds good to you. Um, flexible dieting is one that was around for a while. And it is still that a lot of people still kind of ad, uh, adhere to that you can eat whatever you want as long as it's within your calorie content and within your macronutrient ratio. And yeah, but is that going to be optimal? Like, you know, you could say that, well, you know, if soda and Twinkies and Cinnamon Toast Crunch all fit within that, those ratios, then you can just have that. What do you think about celery juice first thing in the morning? Um, celery juice is good. It's got a lot of vitamins and minerals in it. Uh, it can, you know, obviously getting fluid in, in any way is going to be good. You, it's really, really tough to overhydrate. Um, there is a very specific condition called hyponeutremia where your body runs uh, too low on sodium in particular, but electrolytes in general, and it, it can become very dangerous. But usually we don't see that except in like marathon runners, people that have expended a lot of their, their salts and electrolytes through physical activity and sweat and have only been replacing it with water. Um, but yeah, celery juice is good. Um, I usually like to start my day off fairly balanced. Um, with, you know, I usually will do a few soft boiled eggs, um, maybe uh, uh, some fruit, uh, you know, you can do, I, I don't like to eat a giant meal first thing in the morning and, and you know, there's some foods that just seem to lend themselves better to breakfast, you know, not necessarily like breakfast specific foods. You can eat food any time, food is fuel. Um, so this idea of like, well, I can't have, you know, my dinner leftovers for breakfast, sure you can, why not? But it, it all depends on what's going to work best for you. Um, for instance, so like a lot of times I'll do uh, some low sodium V8 is a way to just get some some extra vegetables in if you don't want to you know, chew a whole bunch of vegetables first thing in the morning. I'm not a big fan of living on vegetable juices, which was a thing for a while. And I think a lot of people will still adhere to that of this idea of you just juice all your vegetables because then you miss out on a lot of the uh, the fiber and a lot of the vitamins, minerals, things that are left within the cell structures, the pulp that you would throw away. And plus the sheer amount of vegetables you have to put into your juicer in order to get a glass of vegetable juice out, it, it seems pretty wasteful. Um, in the end, chew your food. Chewing is also going to burn more calories. Sorry if I'm kind of jumping all over the map here. Um, this is a very big topic. Obviously, there are thousands of books on nutrition. And uh, you can adhere to you know, any one of them. It basically... There's no one perfect diet, but there is a diet that will work best for you. And I don't like to use the term diet a ton uh, because most people tend to think of it as a short term thing. It's I'm going to lose this diet until I lose, you know, eight or 10 pounds or whatever, and then everything's going to be fine. Well, that that's not really how it works, because if you're eating one way and it made you unhealthy, overweight, not feeling well, not performing well and not looking the way you want to. And then you found a method of eating that allowed you to get to that that point where you're you're happy with your body composition and your health, and then you go back to eating the other way just because you hit your goal, then that you're gonna wind up right back where you started. There, there's no free rides. There's no, uh, there's no magic bullet. There's no quick easy way out. If there was, like I said, we would all be espousing it. Um, so like I said, the first step for the majority of people is to start keeping a food journal so that way you're aware of everything you're eating. Because a lot of times there's sort of mindless snacking. There's foods that kind of creep their way in that you didn't really realize like, wow, okay, maybe I was. And if you look at it from the, the total week perspective, you're like, wow, I, am. I thought that, you know, my, you know, one or two beers a night, if that's your thing, well, it wasn't that big a deal. Well, if that, that beer is, you know, two to 400 calories a pop, let's say you had two of those a night, that's 800 calories. You add that up, do that every day, that'll definitely add up. So it's generally about 3,500 calories per pound is what we need to either consume that much more to gain weight or consume that much less, either through um, calorie restriction or exercise in order to, to lose weight. So once again, 3,500 calories up gains a pound, 3,500 calories down loses a pound. And you want to look at it over the course of a week, two weeks, a month. It's better to look at, but you have to start with, you know, what do you do day to day? I'm a big fan of the phrase. How do you feel about long-term fasting, salt, vinegar, and water diets for extended periods? You know, talking about fast. Two fasting questions right in a row. Um, so, hmm. 
fasting, once again, this is a, a deep rabbit hole uh, that you can go on. And some people do really well with fasting. I, it really depends on on your personality type, on your body composition. Um, I find for most people, it's kind of like the last bullet you want to fire. That if you're already exercising intelligently, if you're already eating relatively well, you know, you've got a, a good diet of lots of fruits and vegetables, um, you know, healthy amount of protein, um, keeping your, your simple carbs under control, uh, getting your healthy fats in, your stress levels under control, you're getting enough water, like you've already hit all the other big rock stuff and you want to try tinkering with intermittent fasting, sure, you can do that. Um, but I would start with a short fast, start with like 10 to 12 hours. And that's fairly easy to do if you want to structure it that way. If you stop eating before 7 p.m. at night and you don't eat again until 7 a.m. the next day, that's a 12 hour fast. And that, you're sleeping for most of that. That makes that pretty easy. It's kind of like lifting weights. Yeah. If you wanted to come in and deadlift 300 pounds on your first day, that probably wouldn't be the best way to go. Neither is going, all right, you know what? I've been eating too much. I'm just going to stop eating for three days straight. Three questions in a row about intermittent fasting. So yeah, we're kind of in the middle of that right now. Um, so there are people who have done very well with, with intermittent fasting. Um, Martin Burkan is the author of Lean Gains, has been espousing that for a long time, of the 16 and 8 method, which is one of the most popular ones out there, which is that you eat all of your food within an eight hour window and then you fast for 16 hours straight where you only have um, basically water. And then the way he put uh, structures it is to try to have um, some branch chain amino acids right before your first workout of the day. So most of the time that you're working out, you're gonna be sparing your muscle tissue because you've got those amino acids to help protect uh, your your muscles that you're not gonna be digging into those for fuel. And you're gonna be you know burning extra body fat during that time. There's also autophagy, which is a cellular process that goes on during um, extended periods of time without food, which helps clean up uh, broken down cellular structures. It can also help um, stabilize blood sugar. Um, if you're somebody who's constantly ingesting high levels of carbs and you're constantly spiking your insulin, then that can be a problem as well, which intermittent fasting can help with. The, the thing to, to watch out for is that are you making sure that you're still eating enough during that eight hour window, 10 hour window, 12 hour window, whatever it is that you decide to go with. Um, I tinkered around with that for a while, a few years ago, and I certainly got leaner. It definitely helped me drop uh, some of the stubborn body fat. Um, the problem is that I do the majority of like my, my jujitsu and kickboxing and, and that kind of like really intense training at night. And I found that during that eight hours or the period of that eight hours leading up to my training, I couldn't get in enough carbs in order to fuel my activity. So there, there is a lot of ways that you can structure it. If you're somebody who doesn't do a lot of um, high intensity explosive work, uh, then you could probably run fine with it. What they've done in a lot of the meta studies, which is where they take a ton of different studies and look at all the results of them together to kind of make some uh, larger theories, larger correlations, is they found that when you account for um, calories and protein, there really isn't, doesn't seem to be a ton of advantage from a weight loss perspective from intermittent fasting over just basic uh, calorie restriction. So as long as you're eating enough and not eating too much and eating enough protein, then the, the fast could just be an extra stress that you're throwing on that you might not need. So it's one of those, if you try the fasting and it works well for you and you feel good, Cool, run with it. Yeah, but this is you are your own experiment. You're gonna have to get in there and kind of tinker a bit. Um, but it is definitely a popular method. It's been around for a long time. We said they first started doing the epilepsy experiments back in the early 1900s. So it, it's certainly something that's been around for a long time. It, it only really kind of caught uh, traction as a weight loss method um, within the past like 15, 20 years or so. But it's a way you can go. Um, so back to kind of the nutritional science side of it. Um, so carbohydrates and protein each have four calories per gram and fat has nine calories per gram. So every gram of fat has more than twice as many calories as a gram of protein or carbohydrates. So uh, even though you have healthy fat sources, things like you know nuts and avocados and olive oil and that kind of stuff, um, that is, uh, it's a very easy way to unintentionally overeat. Um, I usually tell most people to uh, eat nuts that they have to shell themselves. So like walnuts and pistachios 
usually dry, um, you know, or just roasted, but not salted. You know, obviously if it's like got that, that like spicy flavoring stuff all over it, that's not going to be as healthy as just like the, the plain dry nut. It won't be quite as tasty. I'm, I'm not going to lie on that. But if you have to crack and shell the nut yourself, you're going to eat them far more slowly than if you just have that bag of almonds that you can just keep constantly mindlessly shoving food into your mouth. Um, red meat myth. Um, there, there are certainly uh, issues with overdoing anything. Um, and red meat has kind of been demonized for a long time. And it, a lot of times it's the, the quality of the meat is not that great. But it's, uh, if you look at like uh, the Harvard uh, meat cancer study that came out a few years ago, um, where they said that eating a hamburger was bad as smoking a pack of cigarettes. One, it was a food questionnaire study, which are not terribly reliable. It only gave us correlations, not causations. Uh, we weren't able to see what the actual mechanism was. And the way the study was structured was not great. Um, because if you take a hamburger, what else usually goes on the hamburger? A white flour bun, ketchup, mustard, pickles, you're usually eating french fries with it, a lot of times drinking beer with it, and you can't really extrapolate out, but they were blaming it just on the hamburger patty itself, as opposed to all that other stuff that went with it. Um, same thing, if you looked at the actual, the food questionnaire, they had pepperoni pizza, they called just a meat food, forgetting that there's also you know, all the dough, the sauce, the cheese, um, all the other toppings that would be on that pizza as well. So... I would say, hey, you know, keep an eye on your cholesterol levels to, for maintaining a healthy diet or meal planning with a busy lifestyle, usually on the run. So what tricks do you have? Um, food prepping. If you can take a day to uh, cook up a good amount of food, especially if you're somebody who's on the run. I know, Kathy, you're, uh, you're working at the hospitals a lot still, which thank you so much for doing all that good work. If you're somebody who has to travel a lot for a living, um, you know, or you, you just are on the run a lot, then taking a day, an afternoon to cook up a bunch of food, whether it's in a slow cooker, crock pot, um, or just stovetop, and just pre-packing all that stuff away into Tupperware containers so that way you have it to pull from uh, during the week, that's going to make things a lot easier. It's when you, when you plan, you're usually good. It's when you kind of are left to your own devices that a lot of times things can, can go off the rails. Um, so having some pre-cut healthy snacks, uh, you know, celery sticks, carrot sticks, um, you know, once again, nuts are, are fine. Um, I, I'm, I like RX bars. These things tend to, to go pretty well for me. They are calorically dense. You know, they're 210 calories a bar, but they have very few ingredients. Um, it has a good amount of protein. It's, it's a, uh, satiating, kind of can hold you over until you get to your next meal. Um, but the one of the big things you want to be able to do is when you're feeling a craving for something that you know is not as healthy for you and there, there's room in just about any diet for any food um there's a whole psychology bit to that as well but we'll get to that in a minute. um but when you're having a craving you need to be able to slow down and ask yourself do i really need this right now and when you can have those conversations and go you know what I'm not really hungry, I'm just bored, which I know a lot of us are bored right now, especially if you're stuck at home. You know, I'm lucky enough to be able to, to come into the office to, to do this live casting and do cleaning and things like that, but I know a fair amount of you are stuck at home, you know, struggling to find things to do. The thing you shouldn't be doing all the time is just eating, just especially where you're not moving around as much as you were before. Um, if your overall activity level is lower, then you need to keep an eye on your total calorie intake. And that doesn't necessarily mean tracking down to the very last calorie because that can be somewhat inaccurate as well. And um, next time I'm on here, I'll show you guys a method to uh, to kind of track your food intake and to structure your meals using just your hand, which is the, the Dr. John Berardi uh, precision nutrition, nutrition method. And that seems to work really well for a lot of people, at least as a starting point. And then you can kind of um, adjust from there. But yeah, having some preset healthy snacks that you can take with you for, you know, the ride into work so that way you're not stopping and you know getting donuts and things like that um, that's one of the big things you can start with is once you start journaling your food you'll find that you have to be accountable whether you show it to myself or to another nutrition coach even if you don't show it to anybody you still have to be accountable to yourself that you're less likely to eat the less healthy things when you know you have to write them down because then there's a record of it and that makes you more accountable 
And accountability is a huge thing because once again, you got to take responsibility for every bit of food that goes into your mouth because it is, in the end, it is up to you. You know. Um. So. Hmm. Hey Noah. Uh, you need to be honest with yourself also of what kind of personality type you are. There, there are some people that can do well with um, what you call like a, a cheat meal or an allowance meal or whatever you want to call it, whatever uh, terminology fits best for you. Reward meal. I know some people like where they feel like, okay, I ate really, really well. I was healthy. I exercised, did everything good. Monday through Friday, Saturday night, went out and kind of went off the rails a little bit. That's fine. You know, one meal is not going to totally dis disrupt everything as long as it stays at just one meal. Notice we said, you know, cheat meal or reward meal, not cheat day, cheat weekend, cheat week, or how long we've been in quarantine now, um, cheat past five weeks. Uh, it's one meal isn't going to totally undo you, but a lot of them together will. It's, it's what you do consistently over time is what dictates your results. Um, that's why I said I'm a big fan of consistency over intensity that you can, you know, crash diet super hard for um, yeah, a, a week, two weeks, whatever. But then if you just go right back to doing what you were doing, then you really haven't made any progress. That's why I like to start with cutting out some of the obvious junk. Um, if you know that you're eating too much sugar, you can see that you know there's a lot of foods that are really high in sugar that you're consuming on a pretty regular basis. You probably want to start by cutting those back. If you look at your food journal and you're not eating really hardly any vegetables, then you need to increase your vegetable intake. Um, same thing if you're not eating very many fruits. Now there are, are high glycemic and low glycemic fruits, uh, glycemic index, glycemic load. We can, we'll get into that next time of kind of discussing the difference between the two of those, um, which the glycemic eating is like South Beach, uh, Atkins, things like that have, have been around for a while. And you can make progress on just about any diet as long as you find one that, that fits well for your lifestyle. Um, but you have to you have to stick with it. You have to adhere to it. You can't you know try something for like three or four days and go, well, that didn't work. You need to give any kind of eating style enough time to to really dig into it and and see whether or not the effects are going to be uh, beneficial to you. And same thing, what worked for you twenty years ago might not work now. Your body's different than it was then. So you you really got to start to keep track of things in order to to tinker with it. And after a while, you may be able to start just eyeballing things more. You'll you'll get better at kind of going, okay, and like I know that portion is more than what I need, or I know I need you know more protein at this meal. I know I need less carbs at that meal in order to to really balance everything out. Um, but you also can't compare yourself to anybody else. Um, I have the overarching theory of that guy, which is, is one that I I talk about a lot. That everybody knows that guy or that girl. The one who you know, you know smokes every day, you know, drinks every day, uh, eats whatever they want all the time, always seems to stay fairly lean, can run a 5K at the drop of a hat, you know, never really has any issues and live to be 105. That's great. That's an outlier. That's what in statistics we call that an outlier. So because you know that guy, you're not going to be that guy. That's on organic fruit and meat. Definitely beneficial. Um, the thicker the rind on a fruit, uh, the less important the organic side of it is, it can still be beneficial. Um, but so on something like an apple that has a very thin skin, then organic is going to be more important than on something like a banana that has a, a thicker rind. Um, so where the rind is going to deflect a lot of the uh, the harmful things that could be coming from the external environment. Now, what's the soil quality is, is something else that, that that can be addressed with that as well. Um, organic meat, same thing. You, you have to be careful with the nutrition industry. They like to um, put some fancy labeling and things. Slick marketing is what I, I like to say a lot. Uh, that uh, like eggs is the one that we tend to see the most kind of fluctuations on, which you know, if you've paid attention over the years, eggs were really good and then eggs were really bad and then only the egg whites were good and then now the whole egg's good again and then now it's gotta be a uh, free range chicken and you know, uh, organic chickens, natural chickens. <clears throat> Natural is probably the least uh, specific term in the, the nutrition industry. A natural egg just means that it came out of a chicken's butt. That's all it means. It doesn't tell us much of anything. Um, same thing, a cage-free chicken might have just been in a, you know, 40 chickens in a tiny coop. 
they're all still crammed in together. It, it's really no better than if they were in cages. Now, a, a true free range organic chicken is going to live a you know, healthier, happier life outside. Um, as far as what the nutritional benefit is of the eggs of the other, um, some of them will have some extra omega-3. A lot of times they'll feed um, flaxseed and things like that to the chickens to mix that in with their feed in order to help increase the um, omega-3 content of the eggs. Now, once again, that means that the chicken ate something that has an incomplete omega-3 fatty acid in it. It got processed through the whole chicken's body and then potentially some of that made that down into the egg. Once again, there, there's a lot of variability that goes along with this. Um, but it, I'd say, depending on what your budget is, buy organic whenever you can. It's certainly not going to hurt you to buy organic foods, um, and, it, and it may be more beneficial in the long run. But obviously, if, you know, if you're on unemployment, if you're struggling financially right now, then uh, still try to eat as generally healthy as possible. Um, but there's always going to be a benefit to whether it's a big benefit or a small benefit. That, that's going to vary a lot depending on the food that you're eating. Um, so that's it for today, guys. I know I covered a lot of different things. I kind of rambled around on a lot of stuff, but we'll, we'll try to uh, dig into a different topic each week. Um, feel free to shoot me some messages and let me know if there's topics you want me to cover. Um, I tried to uh, respond to the questions as they were being asked here, but uh, hopefully you all got something out of this. If you would like to inquire about um, some nutrition coaching or counseling, uh, something on a little bit more individual level, um, I'd be happy to work with you. Um, otherwise, I hope you all have a fantastic week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you soon.